joined, welcoming up uh, to the podium from Keep Australia Beautiful, it's Haymore Shoba. All right, um, I'll be working with the mic. I just want to say thank you very much for um, staying here. Uh, it's too easy to have lunch and then move on back to your hotel room and have a sleep. So the afternoon session, thank you very much for staying. Uh, my talk today will have two contents. One will be how circular economy we see it being introduced into your communities. And the other one is a bit of a cry for help for the organisation. First off, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we're gathered here today, the Larrakia people. And it's interesting to think that um, even right here at this spot here, there may have been meetings for the last 65,000 years. So pretty interesting when you realise how long the Aboriginal people have been living here for. Anyway, like I said, so circular economy, how our organisation sees the transition over the next five years into your communities. And don't forget, you're the customers. You guys say jump and I go how high. That's as simple as that. Naturally, I'll be guided by you as well as to where you want to go. So the whole idea of circular economy is this linear economy, take, make, use, dispose, into this circular economy. And trust me, this circular economy is a beast, an absolute beast. So a bit disappointing that council gets lumbered with litter, then they get lumbered with recycling, and for some reason, I don't know where or how, now you guys are going to look after the circular economy. So I hope the governments are paying you for it. <laughs> amazing, really amazing. Um, when the government made the announcement about circular economy strategies, I went and saw a business and I said, I need to sit down and work with you to understand what this circular economy is and how it could affect your business. And uh, he's in the business of providing... Uh, health equipment or, or medical equipment into remote communities. So we took a wheelchair and we sat down, we worked it all out and after a while he said, hey, well, you're telling me when the wheelchair breaks down in three to six months' time, I have to transport it back to a major hub. Then I have to find someone who's got the skill and the knowledge to repair it. Then I have to paint it all up, make it look nice and clean and new and then sell it back into the community. And I said, that's it, buddy, you've got it. And he goes, <laughs> my business won't be supporting circular economy. He said, for me to profit, I need the linear economy. Why would I pay all that extra freight and all that high cost of labour when I can get a wheelchair that looks better and cheaper out of China? So from his perspective, he didn't support circular economy. Um, he makes more profit on the linear economy, and boy, is that a challenge. And I'm not too sure if the government really understands the challenges that are, way, that are uh, ahead of it. It's a bit disappointing there's nobody here. So, the point I want to make now is the whole circular economy loop consists of three main areas, sectors. You've got the manufacturer of the product, You've got the consumer or user, that's the general public, that's us. And you've got the recycler and the waste service provider. The whole idea of circular economy, the, the vision, like Ricky said, no waste, no emissions. That's the grand vision. So technically, there'll be no more landfills. Because all waste will be a resource. That's the vision. All right? When we transition to the circular economy, the manufacturers, they will spend millions. New factories, up-tooling, upgrading, upskilling, engineers, research, scientists. And the waste service providers and the recyclers, they'll spend thousands, millions, upgrading all their infrastructure. But I work in this sector, and that's the general community. It's the people here that pay the levies for the product stewardships. It's the people here whose behaviour will determine how much contamination there is in the recyclers' waste. 
how much the return rates will be. And this is education. So my question is, we're coming out of 21-22 financial year, we're going into 22-23 financial year, budgets are set for the next 12 months. I wonder how many manufacturers of products, how many waste service providers, how many recyclers have set a budget to educate the general public to achieve the desired behavioural practice. And from where I said, it's normally a small bunch. Like I said, the manufacturers, when you speak to them about their products, oh, that's council's responsibility. Litter, recycling. When you speak to the government, oh, that's the manufacturer's responsibility. And in between, the consumer, who is the actual customer of both manufacturer and the recycler and the service provider, is sitting in no man's land and has got no support. And keep in mind, my councils in the Northern Territory aren't rate-based. Rate Most of them aren't. So where does the money come from? So we're getting a bit of money from government. I personally get my organisation a huge in-kind support from the councils with access to their communities, their staff, their venues. So in-kind support, liquid gold, huge. I haven't seen support from the manufacturing industry since the container deposit came in, nor the, the waste service people or the recyclers. So the whole corporate social responsibility for my organisation, I don't see it, disappointed with it, given that what we're talking about here, circular economy, is humanity and it's global. So let's just recap on waste circular economy. So the government has got a five year transition period. Like I said, budgets have been set for the next 12 months. I don't know how much has been put aside for um, education of the community. There'll be regularly changes in framework. We look at community behavioural practices to achieve the desired results at the end of the line there. So the government wants to grow the economy and protect the environment into the future. They want to recover the waste, reuse and recycle. And um, waste now is a resource. So what is a waste from one industry will be, or a byproduct from one industry will be a resource from an for another industry. And that's how it'll work. So a bit about my organisation, we're non-for-profit, community-based, apolitical, 50 years operation in the Territory. Um, we achieve community engagement through education and awareness. And we like to change, I think we're changing attitudes and behaviours through education and awareness to achieve litter, resource recovery and waste circular economy outcomes. So when we talk about community transition strategy, I'm talking about the consumer, the public, that sector, all right? I'm not in manufacturing. I'm not in waste, I'm not in recycling, I'm the general public, the community, I'm the one that pays the levies, okay, that's who I'm talking to. So we've got a two-pronged approach, and again, I'm guided by you guys because you're my customers. So the first thing we're looking at is education, pretty big. Circular education, trying to get people to put rubbish in a bin, a challenge, to put rubbish in one bin and recycles in another bin, a challenge. But then getting the communities to think about circular economy, that is a real challenge. Oops. And more so when you're talking about remote Aboriginal communities where English is a fourth, fifth or sixth language. And I can't get into the communities. It'd be nice to get some of that levy and put diesel in my car so I can get there to educate. And I don't charge fee for service. So we'll use the EcoSchool program, it's a global program, and then the vehicle we'll use for the communities will be the Sustainable Community Tidy Towns program. We'll make it a new category, we'll start focusing on education, engagements with the councils, the store, the schools, the rangers, TO residents, and we start with the McDonald Regional Council in September. 
The whole circa economy is about my actions matter because it is a lot of drops that make the ocean and that's where we're at. Everybody has to take ownership and responsibility. We have to change our way of thinking. So we'll start with these campaigns, acting forward, you know, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? Do the right thing, tread lightly on planet Earth, regularly exercise your, your um, environmental memory muscle. You know, do I need a straw? Do I need a, a plastic bag? And with the schools, we link into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, one of our major local government councils, Darwin City of Council, they're working on goal number 13, climate change. When you go down the road of circular economy, you're starting to involve seven of the goals under United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And at this point, I want to give a shout out. Um, my job is to recognise and acknowledge effort. And I just want to say to McDonald Regional Council, again, you are the leaders. As of last year, they started to plan their community plans, monitoring and reporting under the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So congratulations, you guys, your leaders. There's definitely nobody in the Northern Territory doing it. And I suspect there'd be very few in Australia. So it shows your council's thinking and planning at a global scale. So congratulations, you guys. That's why you're the leaders. Um, the transition steps through education. Like I say, our Eco Schools program, it's a global program. It's linked to United Nations um, uh, uh, Education, Scientific Cultural Organization, and FEE, which is the Federation of Environmental Education, which is global. We started putting lesson plans together in 21. Initially, we thought it was such a complicated matter that we could only deliver it to the high schools. But when we got the teachers involved, they were able to drill it down to the preschools for us, which was absolutely fantastic. And we started the pilot trial. So the pilot trial is an Australian first, and it's in the Northern Territory. Pity the media didn't want to pick up on that one. <laughs> um, it'll finish in term two. And then we'll assess it. We might do a launch towards the uh, start of next year. So it's called eSpace. It's part of eSchool, uh, EcoSchool. So eSpace stands for um, EcoSchool Product Advancing Circular Economy. It's a circular economy program with lesson plans, and it has eight key focus learning points. So we had to sit down with uh, FEE, the Federation. We had to sit down with the teachers. What are the key focal points our community needs to learn, and this is what we'll be teaching them. Now, once we teach the schools and we settle this one down, how do we transition this to the communities? And it's not just the communities, it's a community that's remote, isolated, and English has a third, fourth, or fifth language. And how do we do it, how do we do it without money? There's the challenge. So we do product and our life cycle analysis, um, analyzing the raw materials, the processing of those materials, um, you know, <laughs> how's, how's the ore extracted, the gas, the oil, that sort of stuff. How do they manufacture a product? W when we did this, we did the pencil with the kids. So a pencil has got um, wood, graphite, rubber, steel, around the eraser there, paint, ink. So all those materials, how are they processed? How are they made? How do they pull together to make a product? How do they package the product? How do they transport the product? What's the product's use? How do you dispose of the product? And then what's the impact on the environment? Then they have to learn the principles of circular economy. Why does it make it, what, what is so important about it? Is it because our resources are finite? Is it because we're heading towards a climate catastrophe? What is it? And what is natural balance? They have to learn that. So the water cycle is a natural balance. So it rains in the mountains, it, it uh, irrigates the, the ground and the trees, forms a river, fish swim in it, animals drink from it, comes out in the ocean, it evaporates, comes back again. So that's the cycle. And that's what circular economy is looking towards. Um, they also have to learn what we call circularity on a daily, in terms of daily life. 
It's rethinking the whole process. So circular economy action. So we had them look at some of the case studies, the students, under the pilot trial. One of the big things they're looking at is, um, you know, they can't produce waste. There's got to be no byproducts, zero waste. Looking at separating the biological from technical materials and then using renewable energy, just removing that dependency upon fossil fuels. So the case studies that they came up with was quite interesting. So we said to the schools, look, work on your local markets. It's interesting enough, when we developed the lesson plans and the program, we were looking for an Australian circular manufacturing model, but there's none that exists in Australia. So we had to bung in somebody from Lithuania, <laughs> of all places. Lithuania, Netherlands, Germany, France, nothing in Australia. It was interesting, they looked at the beverage containers scheme. And under a circular economy, it's flawed. So the students said, well, hang on, why can't we put the caps on? So they did the calculation on how many caps, how many bottles, how many in Australia, total tonnage. And then they presented that to the manufacturer in, in um, Adelaide. And he said, yeah, we can take the caps, not a problem. Our process uses detergent, we'll float it out. Put the caps on. When they spoke to the middle guy, he said, no, 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 no. You tell your government to change the legislation before you put the caps on those bottles when you want to recycle. Really sad. That was a wake up for them. They also found, they also did the greenhouse gas emissions. And they asked, why are we driving cars to collection depots when we could just put it in the recycle bin? And while we're at it, why don't we reduce it by 20 cents, the product? So from a circular economy perspective, the container scheme is flawed. This was um, grade threes. Grade threes did this one <laughs> in the pilot trial. It's interesting, NTEX said, we're making enemies, the mines. I'm starting to understand where you're coming from. <laughs> Ink cartridges. They made the recommendation, let's refill ink cartridges. Well, hang on, we used to do that eight years ago. Now there's a microchip that stops it. Well, where did this microchip come from? Well, let's ask Fujitsu, Toshiba. Planet Ark, why is it that you don't bang on about refilling the ink cartridges, but you bang on about recycling the cartridge? So the kids were a little bit confused with that one. I've told them that we'll prepare a letter for the Environment Department to consider those. So they're learning about waste, how to turn it into a product or a resource, about repairing things, clothes, you know, foods, food, uh, the, the food bank, they were looking at the food bank. So it, it was interesting to see how many projects they picked up on that were local projects that seemed to have some really good legs and outcomes attached to it just under the pilot trial. Anyway, the kids, they also have to learn the perspectives of, of um, sustainability, like biomimetics. I mean, this is what they have to learn. The community has to learn this. Does anybody even know what biomimetics is? Does anybody know? Keith. That's right. <laughs> but I expect that from your table. <laughs> You're mimicking nature. <laughs> yeah, well, they're right up there. Come on. Um, it's mimicking nature, and that's what the circular economy is all about. The answers are within nature. Uh, the engineers, the researchers, they're, they're, they're all looking at nature for the answers on a lot of things. So, like the bullet train. It was designed on the kingfisher beak to be the most efficient with wind resistance and the whole lot. Cradle to cradle, no more cradle to grave. So, you know, trying to, it's, a, it's a, a challenge, a, a redesign approach. Performance economy, closed loop. So it's a focus on servicing a good 
instead of throwing it away. So at the moment, when your TV is broken, you pick it up, you throw it in the landfill, you go to um, Harvey Norman, get a new one. But the grand plan will be nobody owns a TV, nobody will own a washing machine or a car, they'll be leased. They'll be on leases. And when the TV breaks down, somebody will come out, take a component out, swap it, away you go. If it doesn't work, they swap the TV. That's the grand plan. More servicing, less throwing out. You won't own cars, TVs, fridges. So it's a huge focus. So again, manufacturing is going to reduce, mining will reduce, but servicing will go up, that sector. Industrial ecology, so <laughs> they're looking at the ecosystems, they're trying to close the loop. Like I said, one factory's byproduct will be another factory's resource. That's how you get no waste, and that's what they're looking at. For what it's worth, Netherlands, their target is 50% circularity, we call it circularity, by 2030. That's not 50% recycling. That's 50% less waste into landfill right across a whole country. And they're on target. And here's our, our government banging on, we, we hope we can get 80% of the glass by 2030. <laughs> no wonder United Nations gives me a hard time when I'm talking to them. Natural capitalism, they have to learn about that. About the, the world's natural resources. Air, soil, uh, water living things, and we have to look at ways how to restore and, and regenerate natural resources. They have to learn about input, uh, impact of products on the environments, material extraction, product manufacturing, packaging transport, the whole lot, product use, product life. And then they have to learn about the impacts of general items like plastics, paper, clothes, water, food. Then they learn about circularity, in their backyard, they'll do it at the school and then at home. And we start introducing it at home to the parents. So they'll have their action plans, they action their findings, and they try to make it better through a, a design of circular economy. When I started, in 2007 apparently, <laughs> it was three R's. We're now, now at nine R's. Anyway, now we talk about how we're going to transmission this into the community. And again, that's the consumer sector in that triangle. So we'll take what we learn at the school, we'll have to simplify it and start bringing it out into the communities and we'll do it with all of your councils and I'll be guided by you guys as we go along. And no doubt we'll make a few mistakes as we go, but anyway, we learn from mistakes. Well, the vehicle will be the sustainable community, the ti uh, tidy towns vehicle. It'll be a new category. We'll do the community education, engagement and rethinking the behavioural changes and we'll do it in the remote, rural as well as the major hubs. We'll just share the circular economy actions currently happening and it is currently happening. Again, our friends here, all their landfill sites have already been set up, all separated. They've already got procurement policies, no plastics. They've already got water bubblers in their communities, so no plastic bottles, that sort of stuff. So we'll share that. We'll tell me I was trying to create a photo book. I don't have the money for it yet, but we'll do it through the regional workshops. We'll take the school resource, the, the e-space, and we'll push it out to uh, simplify it to make it a community resource, and we'll show, uh, workshop that one and um, we'll share any new enterprise opportunities from a circular economy's perspective at our annual forums at the end of the year when we have our awards. So that's just sharing all the information when all our councils are together. Work with our key stakeholders. Again, that community sector, that's school stores, councils, residents. The students are the biggest allies we have and a change agent that we have. So we're utilising them as much as possible. We have the dot point plans and the strategies for the councils and the stores and the schools. So some of the challenges I have to face is 
in a remote community like Umbacumba, first off, how do I get my feet into that community so that I can explain to somebody who's got English as a third, fourth or fifth language that um, reusing a plastic is a better priority than actually recycling a plastic, number eight. So that number three is better than number eight. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of saying to the stewardship people, product manufacturers, waste service providers, help me to help you. Because when you fund me to get my diesel in the car to get there, then I can educate. And we can't, it doesn't work with a silver bullet. You don't fire a silver bullet once and it works. And I'm grateful for one year or three year funding, but it's generational. If you're not instilling these values per generation, you miss out. And then you've got to have a different strategy for that generation that missed out. And we do give a return on investment. So the return we give you is education, less contamination into your waste stream, and higher recovered rates of, re of re recyclables. So one way we'll be starting the cultural change within the communities and this will be community specific, I'm guessing, and we may do something that the community wants to do, but we're thinking along these lines, do the right thing, tread lightly, act forward, regularly exercise your environmental muscle. But that'll be all with your individual communities. Let them make up their own campaign. We'll review your waste at the community level, the resource recovery going on. We'll look at the carbon footprint now. We'll reintroduce equiver bites and procurement. So in a nutshell, we're sort of mimicking what McDonnell is doing now at the Regional Council, okay? So the spreadsheets for the carbon footprint and uh, equivobytes we'll bring back again. Try to make the products and services within your, your community and the materials that you use circular, which we'll I identify. Regenerate nature where possible and improve food security. So we've already commenced that and we've got both correctional services helping us with that. So the whole idea is to change, like I said, from this linear economy to this circular economy, and boy, is it a beast. So the Actions Matters campaign, and we're linking it to United Nations. So McDonald's have asked that I assess their communities under the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. For what it's worth, you've influenced the first Aboriginal homelands to doing all their planning and reporting against the United Nations Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals. So good on you guys, you're good leaders. Um, for the manufacturers in the room, the waste service providers, the recyclers, the consumer in this recycling loop is your weakest link in the chain. Budgets have been set for the next 12 months. We're into a five-year strategy you know, how much support are you giving to this education component, awareness? Because like I said, poor councils, they get lumbered with litter, then a few years later they get lumbered with recycling, <laughs> all of a sudden I don't know where it's come from, now we're expected that our councils look after circular economy. And you do it all in the smell of an oily rag, because you're not rate based, most of you. So. You need to give yourselves a pat on the back for that one. All right, that's it. Congratulations.